Hello, I'm Janet Rossand. I'm President and Scientific Director of the Gairdner Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Canada Gairdner Laureate Lectures. I'm speaking to you from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, where we host our annual Laureate Lectures every year. Given our location, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to share this place. This year, of course, our lectures are completely virtual. Our laureates are not with us here in Toronto, uh, but our Canada Award laureates are going to be joining us from their homes and offices around the globe. This morning, we're going to be joined by Dr. Rolf Kemmler in Freiburg, Germany, Dr. Masatoshi Takeichi by video in Kobe, Japan, Dr. Mina Bissell in Berkeley, California, and Dr. Elaine Fuchs from New York City. The Laureate Lectures today and tomorrow are being streamed all over the world, thanks to the generous support of our partners, the National Research Council, CIHR, and the University of Toronto. And I encourage everyone watching to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Gairdner Awards, and share your favorite parts of today using the hashtag Gairdner2020. Now, just a little bit about the Gairdner Awards. Annually, there are seven Canada Gairdner Awards given out, five Canada Gairdner International Awards for outstanding biomedical research with impact on human health, one John Dirt's Canada Gairdner Global Health Award, specifically for impact on global health issues, and one Canada Gairdner Whiteman Award reserved for a Canadian scientist showing up outstanding scientific excellence and leadership in the community. And today we're going to be hearing from four of our international award recipients, beginning with Dr. Rolf Kemmler. identify so-called cell adhesion molecules in the development of mouse uh, early embryos. We used an immunological approach. That means we produced antibodies against the outside of the embryo and cultivated the embryo in the presence of these antibodies. And we identified which is the protein which is recognized by these behavioral active antibodies. And it turned out that this is what is later called e cartierin the member of the cartierin gene family. We identified in the cytoplasmic domain of this e cartierin associated proteins which we called catenins. These proteins have a profound role in development. If one of these components is missing, the adhesive mechanism is defective, and this becomes more, even more apparent when you translate this now into medicine. And uh, this is a hotspot in tumor research on carcinomas. So we, for example, developed monoclonal antibodies against e cartierin which are very helpful in clinics, so they can characterize the, the tumors which appeared. Well, when I learned that I won this award, this was something really unexpected for me. And I'm really very grateful to the Gartner Foundation. Moreover, I'm very grateful that I won this award together with Masatoshi Takeichi, whom I know over decades. So, I would like to start to thank the Gertner Foundation for this award. I feel very honored, and this means really something very important to me. Now, I have 50 years ago or so, when I was a young postdoc, 
joining the Pasteur Institute in Paris and working with François Jacob. The group at that time was working with embryo carcinoma cells because embryonic stem cells were not available at that time. So the focus on the characterization of cell surface structures, which are specific in embryo carcinoma, which disappeared during differentiation, and eventually some of these antigens may be in the uh, embryo also expressed. So, a very famous antigen at the beginning of the 70s was the F9 antigen you may have heard about. And I was involved in the first two years in this uh, research. So, how can I go ahead? Next slide, please. But I was also looking for my own research project. And I came to the mouse plus pre implantation development, which is the scheme here. You see the fertilized egg divides, divides more or less 12 hours each one. And at the beginning, there are loosely attached cells, but very soon later, these cells compact and form a morally. The morally, which is a prerequisite for the first differentiation step of the outside forming trophectoderm, which makes the conjunction to the uterus epithelial and in the inner cell mass some cells which are, uh, give rise to the embryo proper. So this compaction you see, is maximized. Individual cells boundaries are no longer visible. This suggested to us that there should be some cell-cell adhesion molecules in that. And uh, we were interested in that, and we uh, cultured two cell embryos in the presence of all serum we had available in the lab. None of them had any effect on the plastocyst formation, because this was our readout. Uh, also, the antibody stains the cell surface of these embryos. There was only one antiserum which had an defect. In the next slide, can I do this? So the cells grow in the presence of the antibodies. You have here at the left side the compacted morally, as I said, differentiated into trophectoderm. And in the presence of these antibodies, cells grow. So it was a non toxic, reversible effect, which was in the presence of these antiserum, some which we don't, didn't know which was. Uh, and we uh, was intrigued what was the cell surface structure which are controlled by or by these behavioral active antibodies. So at that time I went to Tübingen, to the Friedrich Mischer Laboratory of the Max Planck Society. And our goal was to identify 
the cell surface structure recognized by these behavioral antibodies. So we use embryo carcinoma cells, in, which grow as aggregates here. Can I go back? So, uh, and depending on the amount of the antibodies, they, these antibodies also separated these embryo carcinoma aggregates. And comparing now this cell line, where we had an effect on the antibodies, with a cell line where we had no effect on the cell line. We, we, I should say, was my PhD student in tubing Dietmar Festweber undertook a biochemical approach to characterize what are the differences between these sensitive versus insensitive embryo carcinoma cells. And this was a hard work and uh, a lot of biochemistry, membrane biochemistry, and a lot of 2G gel analysis cut, uh, cut out single spots of a TB gel, make antibodies against, and going back to this uh, embryo carcinoma cells to see if they have an effect. And there was one spot which I don't know what to do now. Ah, so one, here you can see how it's working. So the anti-E cartilin, how it's called, uh, is now uh, in these polyvalent antibodies. We don't know how many antibody specificities was in there. There was one specificity which blocked this aggregation. Once you had this, and of course, this polyvalent antibody also blocked molar compaction. When we had this, we could also uh, isolate the gene for this. And uh, could transfect in these genes, which is now called e cartierin the founder member of the gene family, of the Cartierin gene family. And the sole expression of these fibroblasts induces morphological changes, as you can see. They form a epithelial sheets. This showed us actually two things. This suggested to us that two molecules from neighboring cells interact with others, and also that this process is calcium dependent. I don't know. From this, we could now do further biochemical analysis to identify what are the outside mediated adhesive mechanisms. And we had one surprise that when we introduced e in fibroblast independent of mouse, chicken, or human, she introduced e complex with endogenous molecules. And these associate with e and are translocated to the cell surface. This was something we found intriguing. And uh, it is indeed so that we analyze these e cartierin catenin, how we call them now, catenin, alpha, beta, and gamma catenin, 
which complex to the cytoplasmic domain of E catene and uh, we uh, yeah showed success that this complex formation is of very important uh, function for the outside medial adhesiveness. Whenever one of these components is missing, this affects the outside mediated adhesiveness very strongly. At the same time, we had uh, established embryonic stem cells and we our ESD3 cells were very robust cells that could be genetically modified and we made knockouts of our all of our components and this is a scheme E-catenin and alpha-catenin make the same phenotype that means the embryos cannot cannot form a functional trophectoderm and they are lethal at some time. Beta-catenin affects mesoderm formation very soon, later, and gastrulation. So these embryos cannot form a functional mesoderm, a primitive streak. Only placoglobin has a phenotype at heart development. So beta catenin was something which attracted us a lot because it has a major role, central role in the cell-cell adhesion complex. So it links, binds to the cytoplasmic domain of E catenin and it links to alpha catenin. And so the whole complex is connected to this actin based cytoskeleton. So this is an important thing because if you have a correct assembly of the this also gives you uh, a clear adhesive. But at the same time, beta catenin is a central component of the wind signaling pathway. So it has a say, has a oh. what is this? So it can, as a signaling you know, transcriptional co activator of left TCF uh, transcription factors control the expression of target genes. And uh, this is something we followed, we were interested in, this dual role of beta catenin in either the cell adhesion complex or in the uh, signaling pathway attracted our attention a lot and we found that in the absence of any wind signaling beta catenin level in the cells is controlled very pretty much by a destruction complex composed of several components, APC, axin 2, but also K2, 
kinases, GSK3 beta and CK1, which assures phosphorylation of beta catenin at the exon 3, and this phosphorylation primes proteosome degradation. So the overall level of beta catenin in a cell can only be either connected with the E catenin or with a catenin catenin complex or upon a wind signal. If a wind signal comes outside, binds to uh, binds to a receptor, this destruction complex is assembled, disassembled, and cannot work anymore. So beta catenin become enriched in the cytoplasm and can go to the nucleus. And as you see here, together with uh, left TCF transcription factors, bind and initiate target gene transcription. And by this, we could identify several genes which are controlled by this pathway, particularly in mesoderm formation. Uh, but the e catenin cutting complex is even more important during development in the formation of a functional epithelium. As you can see here, uh, epithelial are very important structures in, because it separates the outside from the out, inside and e catering is, this is a blow up. e catering is enriched in the adherence junction of, of this <coughs> epithelial cell layer and seals in a way the make a tight connection from the outside to the inside. It is or was an interest then to look in tumors. Many of tumors are of epithelial origin. And you can imagine whenever you mutate or have an effect on the catenin cutting complex, this affects the physiology of the outside mediated adhesiveness. And this is not our work, but this is a summary of the work of previous on showing indeed that in many tumors you have mutations outside mostly, but also in the cytoplasm of E. catherine. What can I do here? It is not okay. Uh, and you have also mutations in beta catenin, but particularly in the exon 3, where these phosphorylation sites are. So when you have mutations there, of course, the mutated beta catenin cannot be controlled by the proteasome degradation pathway, is stabilized and can or may uh, be involved in doing harmful things to the cells.
Okay. So I don't want to end with that. I only show you one piece of work which we recently published in our emeritus group, which concerns Exxon 3 the, of Peter Catini. Where can I? No. So this is this white box here. We identified a lysine in Exxon 3 which becomes trimethylated by ECH2. Can you give me the next slide, please? Oh, okay. So, thanks. No, one back. So we identified lysine 49 in exon 3. And this is the neighborhood of all these phosphorylation sites I mentioned before. And this lysine is trimethylated by ECH2. And the surprising thing for us is that this lysine is also has been reported being acetylated by CPP. So two different methylases uh, or acetylation target the same lysine, which we, if you are interested in, which we have worked out by Katrin Hofmeier in a recent cell report paper, actually, which is our <coughs> last paper of my group. But this, of course, stimulates at least my fantasies. How can it be? How can you regulate methylation? acetylation and what are the biological consequences of that. So we have made monoclonal antibodies against the trimethylation or the acetylation form of beta catenin specific for to follow these modified proteins during development and in uh, cell lines. So, next slide. So, from this, we would like to show, or now be shown in the paper, that lysine 49 represents a hotspot for the regulation of beta catenin. If it's methylated by ECH2, it can associate with polycom components and by this repressing gene activity, as we have seen shown in the paper by SOX1 and 3, no other problem. If, in contrast, the same lysine is acetylated by tritorex complex component CPP, it's associated with gene activation. So this balance of both is something very important, we think, and needs more investigation, that's for sure. And we, uh, yeah. Can I have the next slide? Oh, no. Oh, yeah. 
Well, this is just a little sugar at the end. The trimethylene monoclonal antibody we selected, you see here, is concentrated in the nucleus compared to the, on the right side, complete beta catenin, total beta catenin, which is more associated with the cell surface. So, trimethylene are expected where they should be, trimethylene beta catenin, and uh, it is also surprising that this trimethylation is present in embryos much earlier than the gastrulation or the expression of the mesoderm in these cells. This is also still an interesting thing. So, oh, this is a summary slide. So, what I wanted to tell you is that isolated cells need to recognize each other to act, bind to self versus non-self. And this leads to cell-cell recognition and attention, as you are seeing here in the middle. And this induces other cellular mechanisms, which in included remodeling of cell surface and cytoplasm. And from this, you can, as in our case, be the, make the basis for functional epithelium, which, as you know, are, <coughs> have a very important role in development. Okay, that is what I wanted to say. Uh, What is yet? No, I wanted to thank you. Oh, be back. Yeah, I have to thank many people, of course. First of all, Francois Jacob, uh, because the work started in his laboratory and he was very supportive for my work and was a great partner for discussion. Later on, I moved to the Friedrich Mischer Laboratory of the Max Planck Society in Tübingen, where we did a lot of work. And from there on, I went to the Max Planck Institute of Immunology and Epigenetics in Freiburg. And I have to thank all this, and particularly the Max Planck Society, because the Max Planck Society give me the freedom to develop our ideas. And of course, I have to thank many, many colleagues during these years and decades. And it was really an enjoyable team I worked to, and many of them made their way afterwards. And last but not least, I have to thank my family, particularly my wife and my two children, who gave me all the support I needed to do my work. I sent uh, the Gartner Foundation as I had say, and Max Planck Society. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. It was wonderful to hear the story from the very beginning. Uh, my favorite stage of development, the early embryo, uh, taking you through the story of, of identifying adherence, beta catenin, and continuing today to understand more and more about the molecular pathways. There's lots more to be learned as we'll, we'll hear more later in these talks as we talk about wind signaling as well. 
So just to remind people that Rolf Kemmler uh, was awarded the Canada Gairdner Award for his discovery along with our next speaker, Dr. Matsutoshi Takeichi, for the discovery, characterization and biology of coterins and associated proteins in animal cell adhesion and signaling. So congratulations, Rolf. We're now going to move on to Dr. Takeichi, Masatoshi Takeichi, joining us from Kobe, Japan, who essentially shared the discovery of the coherence in their complexes. Animal cells, including our human body, are made up many, many cells. My challenge was to find out mechanisms by which cells stick to each other, which is a very important process for body formation. I discovered a protein named cadolin. If cadolin is lost, tissues fall apart. I also found there are many different cadolins expressed by different organs. For example, brain cells have one cadolin, intestine cells another type of cadolin. Through this mechanism, brain cells like to adhere to brain cells, intestine bind to intestines. They are not mixed up. So this is very important mechanism to maintain order in tissue constructions. Okay, discovery of cartrain greatly facilitated the study of how cells interact with each other, how cells stick to each other, and also it stimulates the work how cell cell adhesion influences other biological processes such as cell differentiation and cell proliferation and cell motility. And also other people scientists discovered colorine defect mutation or dysfunction cause many kind of diseases such as brain disorder and cancers. So this field has been great, greatly expanded by discovery of colorines. So in the future, in the basic field, we would be able to understand in more depth how our body is constructed. Also in medical field, our knowledge about Cadolhane would facilitate development of treatment for many different diseases like cancer and brain disorders. Good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to receive Gardner International Award and give this lecture to you. In this presentation, I'd like to tell you about how we discovered cell cell adhesion molecules important for body formation. Now, I'd like to begin my talk by commenting on, on early history of the cell adhesion field. In the first, first half of the 20th century, Many scientists such as Wilson, Holtreta, Moscona found that animal body or tissues can be dissociated into single cells by various treatment. And when these cells are properly cultured, they deaggregate and deform into the original multicellular structures. These observations told us animal cells are able to self-organize into tissues. And this is amazing ability of animal cells, and therefore people got interested in mechanisms underlying such cell behavior. Two major questions at this stage of the field were how cells adhere to each other and how different cell types sorted from others to establish this architecture. However, people could not identify cell cell adhesion and cell sorting mechanisms until 1970s. Uh, so this was a historically back, historical background of my early study. 
When I was a graduate student, I was studying lens differentiation. It was thought some factors are uh, released from neural retina and lens cells respond to such hypothetical factors to differentiate. I wanted to identify such factors. To this end, I captured retinal cells and lens cells and added the medium conditioned by retina to lens cultures and expecting lens cells somehow respond to the conditioned medium. However, I, I could not observe any response lens cell to the retinal medium in terms of differentiation. This, this was quite disap at, at disappointing period. When I was watching cell by microscope, however, I became aware of some unexpected something unexpected. When I use a fresh medium as a control, cells immediately attach to the dish. Whereas in the conditioned medium, cells attach to the slowly and also depending on temperature. This was strange and decided to understand how such difference was produced. Then further observations indicate that conditioned medium contains some protein and this protein quickly can't coat the culture dish before cell attaches to, the, to it, like, like this. That is, with conditioned medium, cells attach to protein coated dishes, whereas without it, cells directly attach the plastic or glass surface. Furthermore, magnesium was required adhesion to this protein coated dish, but not for the adhesion in, in fresh medium. In addition, when I was looking at cell-cell contact, I found they require calcium rather than magnesium, like this. Through these observations, I learned how complex cell-cell adhesion is and multiple mechanisms seems to exist. However, I had no idea or technology to further investigate mechanisms underlying this phenomenon. So, after receiving a PhD, I decided to join Dick Pagano's laboratory in Carnegie Institution in Baltimore. He was studying the interaction of liposome with the cell surface. And I thought this would be a good model system to study cell cell adhesion in my future. To do some experiment, I prepared a suspension of V79 cells, which are daily used in Pagano's lab by trypsin treatment. In my experience at Kyoto University, trypsin treated cells generally re-aggregate during cultivation. Curiously, however, Cell did not aggregate at all in Pagano's lab. This was strange and surprising to me. Therefore, I tried to understand why. I checked many possibilities and noticed that recipe to prepare trypsin solution was not identical between Kyoto and Carnegie. Carnegie's trypsin solution contained EDTA, but Kyoto solution did not. I suspected this difference might be key. Since EDTA divalent cation chelator, I purposely prepared trypsin solution containing EDTA, calcium, or magnesium, and treated cells with these solutions. As expected, cell treated with trypsin plus EDTA did not re-aggregate. However, when trypsin plus calcium was used, cells came off as an aggregate from the dish. These aggregates could be dissociated into single cells by washing with calcium minus medium. When calcium was added to their suspension, cells aggregated again. From these observations, I propose a model. There must be 
calcium-dependent adhesion protein, which can be digested with trypsin in the presence of EDTA, but not in the presence of calcium. So this model nicely explains what I observed so far. Now to test the model, I try to search for cell surface protein which are present in the cell treated with trypsin plus calcium, but not in cells treated with trypsin plus EDTA using radio ionization method. I will call trypsin plus calcium as TC and trypsin plus EDTA as T from now. So spending several months, I could finally find the difference between TC and TE treated cells as shown here. You can see some bound specific to, to TC. However, at this moment, I have no evidence that this is really adhesion molecule. To prove its involvement adhesion, I need antibody specific to this protein to test whether adhesion can be inhibited such antibodies. However, it was difficult to purify such tiny amount of surface, surface protein for producing specific antibody. To overcome such problem, there was another way to identify adhesion molecules as explained in the next slide. Immunize animals with whole cells. The animals randomly produce antibodies against surface protein. And if you are lucky, antibodies may contain those to recognize cell adhesion molecules. Once such antibody obtained, you fractionate cell surface proteins and mix each of the fraction with the antibody. If some fraction neutralize antibody blocking activity of the antibody, you can regard it as a strong candidate for adhesion molecule. So I inject rabbit with V79 cell. However, rabbit never produce blocking antibody. So I had to overcome this problem. While thinking about solutions, I happened to read a paper by Rolf Kemmler and Francois Jacob. It is known that mouse embryos undergo compaction at the stage by increasing adhesion between blastomeres. Kemmler shows that antibody raised against teratocarcinoma F9 cells inhibit compaction, as shown here. It also known the compaction is calcium dependent process. I became aware that this observation was quite similar to our, our observation of V79 cells. That is, V79 cells shows compacted adhesion in the presence of calcium, but very weak adhesion without calcium. I thought we must be looking at same or similar cell behavior and I decided to change the experimental cell to teratocarcinoma for getting adhesion blocking antibodies. It turned out this was the right decision. Anti-teratocarcinoma antibodies really inhibit the cell cell adhesion and clearly detecting a TC specific band out of many other proteins. <coughs> Using somewhat complicated experiment, we finally proved that antibodies rec recognize this specific band does block cellular adhesion, verifying my initial model. Two years later, we also isolate monoclonal antibody named ECCD1, which has the ability to inhibit teratocarcinoma cellular adhesion. Uh, this monoclonal antibody also recognizes TC specific band. We thus became confident that we identify right calcium sensitive adhesion molecule, decided to name it Cadorin. Um, during this experiment, 
we are observing another interesting phenomenon. When different cell types such as F9 or V79 or F9 or fibrous were mixed after TC treatment, they form independent aggregate like this without mixing. This suggested as different surfaces may have different adhesion molecules, but having similar trypsin calcium sensitivity. To test this idea, we used brain cells to isolate new monoclonal antibody that recognize TC specific protein and actually succeeded in obtaining NCD2 or NCD3. And we found NC2 recognized brain, but not liver cells. By contrast, ECCD1 recognized liver, but not brain. Assuming we are dealing with similar molecules, we, we decided to call NC2 as n coloring and ECCD1 target as e coloring by remaining, renaming original ad coloring. Meanwhile, we identified a third molecule named p coloring and analyzed amino acid sequences of the three molecules by collaborating with Dr. Sakiyama in Osaka University and finding that they share conserved sequences. This was the real demonstration that coloring indeed form a molecular family. Then in 1987, we cloned cDNA of e coloring and introduced it in L cells, which are not cohesive to each other, finding that L cells came to co cluster, showing e coloring, is a, showing e -coloring at cell cell boundaries. And this experiment gave conclusive evidence that coloring is adhesion protein. Using CDN transaction method, we also confirmed binding specificity of each cadrain molecule. We prepared L cells, transect E cadrain or P cadrain, and mix them, and finding they form separate aggregate as shown below. The movie at the right panel is a more recent image prepared um, by Hideru Togashi and Kobe University. Here, e coloring and n coloring tran transfectant mix. Please watch them. They initially attach to one another, one another, but eventually form independent aggregate. This slide briefly summarizes the tissue distribution E and N coloring in an animal body, showing E coloring expressed in epithelial tissues, whereas N coloring expressed in brain, in skeletal muscle, and so on. During development, ectoderm initially expressed E coloring, but when mesoderm differentiate, it begins expressing N coloring. Also during neural tube formation, e coloring replaced with n coloring. These findings made me recall the classical observation that different tissue cells are sorted from each other when mixed. Thus, it is likely cell type specific expression coloring and their binding specificity may contribute to the segregation of different cell types in the body, at least in part. Also, we need a further confirmation of this idea. And studies in many other laboratories identify more than 20 cadmium subtypes. It is now known single cell generally express multiple cadmium subtypes, causing the expression pattern is very complicated. An importance of cadmium in tissue morphogenesis was tested by JNO cut experiment. For example, removal of n in mice induced fragmentation of cardiac muscle layers 
And also this song is a cortical architecture in the brain. <clears throat> it should be remembered that knockout of single cartilage does not always disrupt tissues, uh, probably because other, other cartilage or other adhesion mechanisms still sustain their structures. Concerning invertebrate, we identify Drosophila cartilage, and it seems all metazone species have some form of cartilage, suggesting the general importance of this molecular family in multicellular body formation across the species. Although their extracellular domain organization are quite diversified. Finally, I want to summarize our current knowledge about how cathodrine works for cellular adhesion. Extracellular domain is subdivided into five EC domains and it undergo homophilic interaction with the same molecule via the EC1 domain. <laughs> Calcium binds the hinge region of the two EC domain in order to stabilize sli slightly curved shape of the extra domain. To the cytoplasmic domain, protein called catenin, which were named by Rolf Kemmler, bind. In another seminar during the Gardner event, I will discuss how this molecular complex functions in tissue formations. And before ending my talk, I should emphasize that many other groups contributed cathodrine identification in early 1980s, as I listed, listed up some of them. I would like to share my honor with these great scientists. Now I'd like to thank my supervisor, the student, and all other people involved in my research. Without their support, I could not accomplish anything. Okay, now I close the slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Takeichi. And again, a wonderful sort of historical view of how working in epithelial cells and culture you can end up with the parallel findings from working on an early embryo. So we're now going to move on to our third international awardee, Dr. Mina Bissell, who's joining us from Berkeley, California. between 10 trillion, trillion, 10 to the 13 cells. Some people say 30 trillion, some say 70 trillion, but it's in trillions. They all have the same DNA. And meaning, meaning that the sequence of the genome in all these things is the same. So why aren't you a lump? Why aren't you? you a nose only. How do, does your body know that your cheek is your cheek and your elbow your elbow? These molecules are insoluble, they are huge and for example, one of them that people would recognize is collagen. And they are really, really large molecules and they're totally insoluble and they're outside the cell. In the beginning, people just didn't know what ECM was. They didn't know why, what this molecule even did. They didn't think that it had information. It was a process of development. I think it's going to give rise to one of the most important um, treatment uh, in the form of an antibody, which is an inhibitory antibody. And this inhibitory antibody attaches to one of the receptors on the cell surface. And there's a huge uh, family of them called integrins. 
and I finally uh, used an inhibitory antibody to that integrin to bring the level in the surface of the tumor cell from say 5x to 1x. You only have one life, do something good with it and trust yourself and pick up a project that solves a big problem. Hello. I must start right now. I was unexpectedly uh, confronted with something that I had already said. So I'm not going to have to uh, embellish that too much more. But the title of my talk is Why Don't We Get More Cancer? And uh, it is a broad point of view to try and understand how is it that when you have the sequence of the genome in your 30 trillion to 70 trillion cells to be the same, how come you are so delineated? How come your mouth is your mouth, your nose is your nose, etc.? And I was a chemist and a bacterial geneticist and I became very interested over years to this problem of how normal cells are normal and how they stay normal and all of the uh, event that that goes into making us who we are and why do our cells go wrong and why do we get cancer even though the title of my talk is why don't we get more cancer and that really tells the role of the molecules I'm going to talk to you about. So, um, let's see, uh, Ben, I need to be changing these and I don't see that it does. Um, okay, this huge question, it says, um, uh, okay, so uh, this, I, I raised this question. So now we go to, um, I am having, let's see, Ben? Okay, this shows, my goodness, I don't know between my picture on the right and the number of zeros that determine. <laughs> All right, so the unanswered questions for us was how does, how is the sequence of the genome is the same and we are all, our tissues are so different. I am having a problem changing this, uh, uh, these slides. I'm sorry. Okay, all right. All right, so as you see, uh, the, the cells of the mammary gland here are quite polar. They have a well-organized nuclei here. And, and when you look at them, they have a top and a bottom. But when you put them on a tissue culture plastic to grow them, they actually use it, uh, lose it. So we kept asking the question, here is a fat droplet that is uh, coming out of this beautiful cell in vivo. Here is uh, the uh, way that the nuclei uh, are organized in the mammary cells. And here is the mouse mammary cells when you put them in 2D plastic. Just look at it, it's, it's the same magnification, a very, very old, uh, slides from one of my wonderful postdocs, Joanne, Joanne Emmerman, who is Canadian, and uh, and uh, was in my lab, and we looked at these things and we said, what happens? What happened to milk? What happened to this beautiful architecture? And we finally discovered that we have to go back to the origin of how these cells are situated in vivo. 
So here is the breast of a human human. We have about uh, five or six of these gorgeous uh, branching trees. Here is the nipple. And we decided that mass was too complicated. The whole breast was too complicated. So we decided that what we are going to do is we are going to take an organoid that occurs before in the middle of the pregnancy of the mouse and it's called an asinus and it, these cells here are epithelial cells they are secreting milk into the lumen and they have a very interesting structure around them which at the time I didn't know what it was and now we know that it is a basement membrane and it is actually uh, made of extracellular matrix molecule that get together and make a kind of a uh, um, uh, outside boundaries uh, for these beautiful asini. The, uh, the plural is asini. So I decided that the reason the, the uh, cells lost architecture, the reason that uh, they would not make milk is because they lost architecture. So in 1989, we published a paper in development and we showed that if the cells are in three dimension and we put them in a uh, extracellular matrix gel that we were able to make in my lab in those days and then later now it's, it's available and people can buy it and it's called matrix gel or laminin-rich ECM. So we put the cells uh, on, on this rich gel, and then they pulled this stuff around their head, and they made this beautiful three-dimensional architecture. And here is what we can make in culture in a low EM, and this is what um, we can, uh, it is actually in vivo. All right. So we could in culture then if we put them in three dimension uh, make a lot of milk that's shown in red that's uh, the milk that got secreted from these molecules here from these asinide and uh, when i was much older they put a milk a mustache and they made a pic they may made a movie of it when i was 60 and they said we got milk and that was sort of one of these ads where they would take celebrities and would say, we got milk. Okay, so we got milk and we had a lot of it. So we asked the question of how could we take the mouse studies into human? Because after all, we wanted to think about normal and human, uh, new, normal human cells and then tumor cells. So I started a, a collaboration with um, uh, Ole Peterson, who, uh, is, uh, a, who was at that time assistant professor in Denmark, and we collaborated for many, many years. And he was an MD PhD. And I said, Ole, you can go to the, uh, to the where they uh, operate on the patients and uh, they do reduction mammoplasty of women who have large breasts and they don't want it and take those pieces that that is thrown away and we can bring it to the laboratory and then we can do this um, uh, uh, study where we put the human cells in three dimension and when we take these cells and put them in tissue culture plastic as you see uh, they don't do anything. They, they, they look like <laughs> what most people use in tissue culture, but they are not looking like this. So we were able to make them to look like this and behave like that. And one of the things we did was that we could show uh, that um, we could grow these cells in culture. The normal cells would grow, grow, grow and then they stop growing and make this lovely three-dimensional architecture. And these are not single cells. These are in fact, some of these beautiful cells. And then on the bottom, we could show that the malignant cells actually would look like a tumor. So it was like having hundreds of thousands of, uh, of clonal growth 
of normal and malignant cells, so we developed this assay, which is so rapid. And it, in fact, we can even do it in four days, as opposed to uh, killing 100 mice and, um, and not having enough statistic. It was a wonderful way of doing it. OK, so uh, to make a long story short, uh, we developed a model of a human uh, uh, breast that came from a woman. Then that started in Ole and his professor's lab. And then when I started collaborating, I began to take these cells that came from a woman and was uh, grown in culture. And they all look the same. I put these cells in 3D. And lo and behold, I could see that in passage 60, uh, where there was a lot of amplification and deletion, uh, the cells are still look normal. In passage 110, they still look like an asinus or like an organoid. 175, they had lost, make got gotten amplified, P53 lost, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they still look well. And then we removed the only growth factor, which was EGF. And then these cells, after a long time, survived and eventually became malignant. So we have a model of, of breast cancer progression that has become a wonderful tool for us. Okay. So we wanted to also talk about the fact that the form of the tissue meaning the organ, the architecture of the organ, in fact, makes function. And function depends on form, and form depends, depends on function. And we came up with a um, hypothesis, the hypothesis I had made in 1982, that these molecules outside the cell have a way of talking to the nucleus and nucleus talks back to them. And I call this the model of dynamic reciprocity. And we decided that one of the things that, uh, that if I am right, and that the phenotype in fact is dominant over genotype, is that to, we should be able to take a single malignant cell um, and, um, and manipulate it depending on what kind of the signaling pathways they have and then looking to see what happens and whether if we take these cells and return them to a look or architecture like this, would the tumor cells actually think they are normal? So. We did this experiment and there they are. It really boggles my mind if we published it in a journal of um, cell biology in 97 with my very uh, capable and uh, wonderful postdoc who was also Canadian. And she uh, is now a professor at UCSF. So we could revert the malignant phenotype by literally changing the architecture. It was very exciting. So we decided uh, that whether or not this was a funny event or could we go back and forth and show that reversion is reversible. So the experiment that Valerie did was that she put uh, these things in, um, in the gel and she could see that without giving them an inhibitory antibody for reversion, they look uh, like tumors. But when we gave them this inhibitory antibody that, uh, that is against one of those integrins that you heard some of those talks about in the last two talks about uh, E-cadherin and catenin, now these extracellular matrix molecules are from outside and they are, they are sort of work together with these other adhesion molecule in order to make us actually who we are. So we took these um, monolayers, put uh, the monolayers, uh, the cells from the monolayer into the gel without inhibiting um, their signaling pathways and they look like a tumor. But then when we actually took these cells 
that had already reverted and looked good and put them in a mono layer and then put them again back into a 3D, they became tumor again. While if we kept the antibody, they became normal, if you will, in, uh, in, in this three-dimensional model. So we decided to go on and find out how these things are done. What are the mechanisms? What are the molecular mechanisms that make these things the way they are? This is a scheme that is maybe a little bit confusing, but here are the tumor cells that are reverting and becoming uh, normal. This is just the skin. But we have learned that there are many things that could bring reversion. So if we downmodulate epidermal growth factor receptor, these cells do this. If we downmodulate MAP kinase, they do this. If we remove glucose, they do this. If we downmodulate beta 1, they do this. And we can also do other things when, for example, when we take tumor cells and allow the distroglycan and uh, these uh, other inhibitory molecules to work, that also causes reversion. So this reversion is very interesting because as I keep saying, is the architecture is dominant over the genome. And the interesting thing is that this is literally a dormant cell. So we can go ahead and study that. And I wish I would have time to tell you about that, but one of my former postdoc, uh, Cyrus Khajar, uh, who is in Seattle, actually had done wonderful studies now in, in dormancy and has discovered the pathway of dormancy, the, the how do the tumor cells actually sit there for years and years and years. And then when something else happened, like the uh, person gets sick or, or there is too much um, uh, inflammation or something else, these things wake up and they kill the patient again from breast cancer or from any, any of these other tumors. Okay, so the main, uh, we began to think and said, which one of these extracellular matrix molecules from the outside are, are really important to make all of these processes to occur? And we have settled on my favorite molecule called laminin-111. And I say laminin rocks, and it is as important as P53. And as I say, I'm not kidding. This is for the sake of the young people who like to, um, to, to learn and open their eyes. And as you see, there are so many different domains in this incredible uh, thing, incredible molecule. And there is a lot of work to do to learn, but we have learned that it is the molecule that actually makes the cells in your body uh, stop growing. When you have laminin-111 added to cell in culture, here is one quick experiment. Uh, oh, I didn't, I guess, put that on. But anyway, we worked about 30 years going from extracellular matrix to the nucleus and tissue specific genes. And all these question marks uh, over the years have been answered more or less by wonderful postdocs and graduate students, more than 100 of them over my very long uh, career. I feel very fortunate to have had these wonderful people uh, who have worked with me. So we then ask the question that we want to know how this asinus is formed. Is one thing to say uh, that we put them in 3D, but how does it get formed? And we ask that question um, through a physicist uh, who came to my lab. And uh, she asked the question of what happens when you put this single cell in gel? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, I'm going to find out. And uh, this is the experiment she did, which boggles my mind. First of all, it shows that these uh, breast cells are, if they are released from the rest of the breast, actually move in a very interesting fashion. This is a 10-day 
a picture um, with a much higher resolution microscope. And as you see, they form this asinus and they look like a real thing from uh, in vivo from the breast of the women. And then we said, okay, let's put tumor cells here and see what happens. So when we do that, if you compare these two, you see that the normal cells on here while they're adhering together, they're like stem cell. One cell becomes two, two becomes three, and they start moving. And we gave it a name. It's a paper in PNAS in 2012, and I'm sorry that I didn't put it down here, but you can look it up. And and uh, she, this is um, so. So we look at the tumor cells, and we see that they're completely separated from each other. They have lost all that adhesion that you heard in the first two talks. They have lost the adhesion of e cadherin and catenin. And here is the actual experiment, this beautiful three-dimensional uh, um, asini are just like the asini of the, of the mammary gland. And if we measure the movement of this whole uh, three-dimensional architect, which is start doing and going like this in culture, you see that the movement is very tight. Now, if we take the polarity molecule called PAR3 out of this, it looks like that. And when you measure the movement, you see that it's a mess. If we now do that with e cadherin that you heard so much about, here is the beautiful asinus. And here are the extracellular matrix around it. And then we can, um, and, and the movement is lovely. And then when we remove e cadherin, you see that the movement becomes all over the place. Okay. So why do the cells stop growing when they encounter laminin? And we discovered to our surprise that the reason has to do with actin in the nucleus. And that, that was done again by another Canadian uh, postdoc. Uh, and it came out in Journal of Cell Science in 2010. And what she showed was that as long as there was, first of all, nuclear acting. People had seen that for God knows how long, and they all used to say, and the scientists would say can't be true, is because actin is sticky and it sticks here. But she showed very nicely that the actin in the nucleus is real, and in fact is responsible for growth. So here are even in 2D, these cells that have that are growing have actin. It's a little hard to see the actin here. It's sort of a green dot, 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 dot. And she shows that when you add laminin, what laminin does is that it reduces the actin very rapidly and eventually the cells stop growing. So it's laminin that tells the nose, don't be a Pinocchio or it tells your mouth you should be a mouth and no more, and no, not longer or bigger, and or to tell the skin what to do, etc., which is, of course, a very important concept. And here is the nuclear actin level. You see, this is a nucleus, and you see that as we add the laminin, it starts going down fast. Even in half an hour, it goes down very down here. We, we actually can do it even with 10 minutes or one minute. And I'm sure sometime in the future, people can do it in seconds. So we now show also that when the three-dimensional model of the normal cells here, you again cannot see the actin uh, very well, but they have about 20% actin because it's involved in uh, transcription, but the tumor cells have huge amount of it. So we have discovered the pathway that actually is, uh, doesn't get turned off in cancer. And if we could turn it off by changing the nuclear actin, the cancer cells are going to stop growing, which is another, another wonderful thing uh, for chemists to try and make molecules. 
So we finally decided, and I'm running out of time, but it's very important to ask the question, how does the signaling pathway goes from one end to the other? How does it, how do we close the loop? And the very uh, brilliant uh, uh, postdoc in the lab, Saul Fruta, who is now a professor in Ohio, um, uh, came to my lab and and did a very lovely paper in eLife uh, that uh, uh, this is this is we said manuscript just submitted to eLife but it published actually two years ago so it shows you is an earlier slide but we could show that we could close the loop and uh, what she did she came she chose uh, about uh, ten um, microRNAs that are uh, in the tumor or not in the tumor or in the breast, etc. And at the end, she uh, chose three of them. And she showed, she showed, let's see, this has gotten a little bit too complicated for the general audience, but here are the three uh, microRNA in three uh, uh, in, in a normal cells, and when the cells become malignant, the microRNA is lost. So she used that information to start and ask the signaling from, from the microRNA in the loop, either upwards or downwards. It is a 40-page paper in eLife, and any of you who are interested in how a tissue is organized and formed, because you know there's only so much we can talk about molecule. After the molecules, we have to go and find the larger and larger organization, which at the end makes us us. How huh? we all have the same sequence of genome. How do we make it? So these uh, studies really shed some light on it. Laminin-1 and laminin-5 talk to each other at the surface. And then uh, these are the three microRNAs. If we go up, we find out that, that this particular, uh, uh, oh, first I'm going down. So there are two nasty uh, transcription factors that actually regulate uh, metalloprotease 9 which is an enzyme that actually destroys the extracellular matrix. So extracellular matrix is necessary for how you are, but as you age, these enzymes start coming up a little bit and uh, start breaking down the ECM and are the cause of actually all your wrinkles. And, uh, and uh, these, uh, this, is, this is one of them is called MMP9. And when these transcription factors are active, they, they come and break up the laminin and the architecture gets lost. When they are inactive by using the microRNA are present, then we, we show that there is a HOXD10, which is uh, actually also in the embryo, but this thing gets activated and that is starts bringing the um, uh, signaling back together. And this is NF-kappa B, which is a nasty, nasty molecule. And it, we have to stop that and turn this on in order to be able to actually learn how this thing goes. So what we did was that we showed that P53 activity was important in the mammary astronaut formation, but we also showed that um, that a molecule called nitric oxide got got uh, uh, appeared and was needed. So after P53, we had nitric oxide, and it um, it is a molecule that is very well known for different reasons. And uh, the normal cells have nitric oxide after addition of laminin, but tumor cells don't have it. And uh, I think, okay, here it is. The tumor cells don't have this. The normal cells have beautiful amount of, of, um, uh, of nitric oxide and nitric oxide is necessary for the formation of the tissues. So this was a very important 
um, discovery. And I think I'm not going to show you this, but if we, we well, I think I better go towards the end of this. So we actually have the entire uh, 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 pattern um, working and the, um, the, um, the, what we have discovered is that there is in, 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 in the um, biochemical signaling, there is also an architectural signaling. And we showed that, that the, these, uh, this is a nucleus. And when we look at this through a very high resolution, we could see that there are these uh, little fingers that walk into the nucleus. And we discovered that nucleus is like a donut that it actually has a single huge tunnel through it. And that tunnel is for full of extracellular matrix. So the beauty of this is, um, is that here it is. Uh, let's see if I can get this to go. No, it didn't go. So come on, you are supposed to start. Oh dear, it's not making the view. Oh. What happened? Anyway, what happens is that there is a beautiful um, cytoskeleton around the nucleus that that allows the outside to talk inside to, to inside. And I'm sorry that it's not playing it for us. Here is a picture of it, but I had that movie that didn't go. And so the, here is the nucleus and here is the extracellular matrix in various formation that goes all the way through. So this is not, this is a single nucleus and this is the tunnel. And this is the way that, that um, actually um, uh, the model that I did in 1982, the hypothesis in 1982 now has come to pass. So this is the nucleus. Here is the extracellular matrix. Here are the uh, receptors for extracellular matrix. Here are the cytoplasm that then connects the outside to the inside. And here is the tunnel. And uh, the tunnel uh, is the dynamic reciprocity of the molecule going up and down. And uh, here is uh, the tunnel. And here is uh, the idea that as you're sitting there, in every one of your organs, there is this beautiful dynamic reciprocity between the outside and the inside. And this model actually has come to pass, which makes me very happy. Uh, we have had people to thank, uh, many people to thank. Uh, and one of them was uh, Manfred Auer, who did a lot of that beautiful experiment uh, of, the, of showing this uh, cytoskeleton and the interaction with the inside. And uh, I have hundreds of students and postdocs to thank. I, and here is my, one, my final slide, more or less, where I say to the young people that you... Um, uh, here is the what, what I like to say is that uh, we know the language of the genome, the alphabet of the genome, the sequence of the genome, and hopefully we'll continue to even have more, but we really don't know the language and architecture of form, of form. Here is water coming into the shore. Here is coral. Here is a whole mount of the mammary gland of the mouse. How does nature make it? So I say to the young people that this is an opportunity for the young and the passionate old. A whole new horizon to go. So go to it. You have one life do something good with it, as I keep saying. And here is my favorite uh, slide where the guy in the suit is telling the cat, don't ever dare to think outside the box. And, and uh, the, the, I like to say that I used to be the cat and this is the suit 
but I tell you, always think outside the box. Dare to do this. And I thank you and I thank Gardner Foundation for this very, very great honor. And uh, here is uh, a picture of the time when I had wonderful people in my lab. And here is uh, the, uh, the picture of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. This is a cyclotron and this Golden Gate Bridge uh, here and uh, come visit us and we will talk science day and night. Here is the Bissell Laboratory and I would be happy to take questions and send you any of the publication you may need. I, that is it, I am done. So thank you so much, Mina. That was a wonderful talk and a wonderful uh, encouragement at the end to all of us to continue to pursue our passions. And now we're going to turn to the next Canada Gardner International Award Laureate this year, Dr. Elaine Fuchs. been fascinated by how tissues make and replace dying cells and how they repair themselves. And it's these fundamental processes that are at the roots of uh, a number of different human diseases, including cancers. And it's these processes then that I've been most interested in, in trying to understand in the course of my career. I'm being recognized for the fundamental discoveries of uh, of the first stem cells, tissue stem cells, which uh, are the stem cells of the skin. And over the years, we've identified where these stem cells are in the skin and learned about their special properties and identified how these stem cells communicate with neighbors in the skin to be able to know when to make tissue, when to make epidermis, hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, and then ultimately what goes awry when these stem cells start to acquire mutations that will give rise to various different human disorders such as uh, skin cancers. And so because these were the first stem cells taken from a tissue and uh, able to be propagated endlessly in the laboratory, our characterization of those stem cells really provided a platform for uh, the early studies of what are tissue stem cells, what do they do, and how do they do it. One of the most exciting areas for me right now is that we've been looking at inflammatory skin disorders, disorders like psoriasis and atopic dermatitis, some of the most common types of inflammatory disorders, um, in fact, some of the most common types of human conditions, we've learned that they retain a memory of their inflammatory experiences. And this is packaged into their nucleus. And so we're trying to understand the details of that inflammatory memory with the hope looking forward that in the future, perhaps we can treat some of these types of diseases with uh, an eraser of memory rather than with the current immunosuppressive drugs, which really have many deleterious side effects. We think that the memory that we're unearthing is really one that's going to be broadly applicable to a variety of different disorders. Uh, and most of all, my postdocs, students, and technical staff, without whom uh, this work would not have taken place, and I would not be standing here today to receive a Gairdner International uh, Award. And I really thank the Gairdner Foundation uh, for their support. And uh, I'd like to start by just saying that my laboratory for many years has been interested in skin. I think. It's a natural fascination that we have with our body surfaces. Uh, in fact, nature clearly has had a lot more fun and fancy in creating body surfaces than she has in any of the ugly organs that uh, are tucked underneath it and that you heard about today. Uh, and, uh, and my laboratory doesn't go that much deeper 
into the skin, but my interest in skin biology as a system to study really came when I was a graduate student working on sporulation of bacteria. And I heard a talk by then Howard Green, who is at MIT, uh, taking a piece of human skin and placing it into culture. And he was able to culture cells out of it, which had the ability to passage endlessly and still make skin. And I was just fascinated with that. I went to his laboratory to train and uh, I've been working on skin ever since. So back when I first started my laboratory, uh, I was actually at that point still uh, starting to grow uh, the skin stem cells in, uh, in a three-dimensional organoid culture. And, uh, and I just say that uh, the key to really culturing the epidermal stem cells was the reliance upon mesenchymal epithelial interactions. These were really early concepts of the notion that stem cells don't operate in a vacuum. They rely upon other cell types in the vicinity or their microenvironment that are important for dictating uh, some aspects of what they do and when. And my former mentor, Howard Green, developed this methodology for the treatment of burn therapy, where he took a small sample of a patient's good, healthy skin, put it into culture, and was able to generate sheets of epidermal cells that then could be grafted onto the burned area of patients. And back then, with some of these patients having 95% of their body surface burned, it was clear that only a few stem cells were really necessary to uh, produce the entire body surface epithelium. And I think that's a remarkable feature of stem cells, their incredible ability to self-renew and to make tissue. We really have a 40-year success of the use of stem cells, in this case, skin stem cells, uh, involving uh, therapy. So, my laboratory, when I began at the University of Chicago, was interested in three major questions that came out of my postdoctoral work. First, how do epidermal stem cells protect themselves from the physical and chemical traumas of the body surface? Secondly, we were interested in how epidermal stem cells make and repair tissues. Indeed, all the tissues of our body have some stem cells and the skin epidermis does a wonderful job of making, replenishing, and repairing its tissue. And thirdly, we are interested in why didn't the engrafted skin of burn patients ever make sweat or make hair? We knew back then that there must be other sources of stem cells that exist within the skin and other niches for these stem cells. So I began then with considering tissue homeostasis in the epidermis. The innermost layer of the epidermis, the basal layer, is the layer that contains the stem cells. And as these stem cells periodically commit to terminally differentiate, they exit the basal layer and begin to migrate outward. And at that point, stop division, but still remain transcriptionally active. They generate a flux of non-dividing differentiating cells that are ultimately sloughed from the skin surface. But before they do so, they have uh, enucleation, a uh, loss of the nucleus and loss of all the organelles and flattened out to form these uh, dead squames that really keep uh, harmful microbes out and essential body fluids in. So what I learned from postdoctoral work is that the stem cells produce an extensive infrastructure of 10 nanometer cytoskeletal filaments that are composed of keratins 5 and 10. This network is compatible with cell division. But the differentiating cells instead produce a robust mechanical framework composed of keratins 1 and 10. And this network provides protection to the body surface. So at Chicago, we then set about to clone these epidermal keratins and their genes. We learned that they form obligatory heterodimers and hence the expression of parrots of keratins uh, at different uh, tissues and in different cell types and conditions. 
we learned that they, accept, they then assemble into these 10 nanometer filaments, and we could do so in a test tube, as well as introducing uh, keratins that were fluorescently marked into epidermal cells and culture. We then identified mutations that when engineered either in a test tube or in culture would disrupt the overall keratin network and its filaments. But we were still left with this question of what are the consequences of lacking a proper cytoskeleton and what human genetic diseases might be caused by mutations in the keratin network. And so at this point, we turned from cell culture with human keratins to looking at transgenic mice. We set up transgenic mouse technology at the University of Chicago. We engineered our mutant keratin gene, and we introduced the mutant keratin gene into mice and uh, made mice. And here we learned very quickly on that when epidermal stem cells lack a proper keratin cytoskeleton, they can't withstand mechanical trauma. And when the mice moved around in the cage, they developed blisters on their skin. This really set the paradigm for what we learned was an intermediate filament disorder. Uh, we learned that the intermediate filament disorder associated with a particular mutation in a keratin is associated with cell degeneration and a sensitivity to mechanical stress, the cells ruptured upon mechanical stress. We learned that uh, at the ultrastructural level, there were clumps or aggregates of intermediate filament protein in the cytoplasm. And we learned that the only uh, cells that were affected by this were the cells that expressed a particular set of keratins. There are over a hundred different keratin genes that we know about now. So we engineered the mutation in the stem cells and it was the stem cells that were showing the sensitivity. When we went to a, a dermatology textbook, we discovered that in fact, there was a human disease called epidermolysis bullosa simplex that mirrored the mouse pathology that we had learned. This is an autosomal dominant blistering skin disorder. And within one year of showing the mouse disorder, we demonstrated that this is a human disorder of keratins 5 and keratins 10, and the epidermal stem cells cannot withstand the mechanical stress without this network. Within another year of this discovery, we had realized that there was a mirror image disease of this particular disorder called epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. And in this case, the degenerating cells were the terminally differentiated epidermal cells. We learned that the stem cells in this disease were perfectly fine, but they couldn't make the skin barrier. And we then showed that, in fact, this human disease is associated with mutations in the keratin 1 and keratin 10. And so this really brought us full circle. It took about 10 years of my career, but it really led us to a reverse genetic a strategy that we had used. This was an unconventional way to solve the basis of human disease. A classical geneticist would choose the disease and seek to identify the gene which, when mutated, caused the disease. As protein biochemists instead, we chose the proteins, in this case keratin, and sought to identify the diseases caused by mutations in the protein. Let me also point out that in addition to the reverse genetic strategy, that before this time, researchers were using transgenic mice to model disease, but they were using it where the disease was known and the genetic disease, the gene uh, cause, causing this disease was also known. And instead, we were using mice as a discovery tool to guide us to the genetic basis of disease, to guide us into the biology of the particular proteins we're interested to work on. And so why express a different pair of keratins during terminal differentiation? Well, in just these past few months, we published a paper that begins to shed light on this longstanding problem that we've had. The body surface is exposed to temperature, humidity, humidity and pH extremes, <clears throat> and its proteins must be indestructible. 
And the cells as well must lose their nuclei in order to form these dead flattened cells that are providing our skin barrier. What we discovered is the keratin 1 and keratin 10 not only form these filaments that bundle, but they also have external tails and head domains that have, undergo a, a conformational change in response to changes in temperature and changes in concentration that uh, form a liquid liquid or oil like connection to the granules that also form during the terminal differentiation process. The granules are composed of filaggrin. So as the terminal differentiating cells move outward, there's this mechanical framework that begins as a fluid and oil like structure. It becomes more and more viscous as the proteins accumulate, and it ends up putting mechanical pressure on the nucleus and the organelles, and that then contributes to their loss. We're also very interested in that the granules, which are also pH and temperature sensitive, uh, might be sequestering certain contents, such as destructive nucleases, that could contribute to the loss of the nuclei. And interestingly, when the stem cells exit the niche and move outward toward the skin surface, they experience a pH gradient. Your skin surface is pH 5.5. And when the pH becomes the pKa of filaggrin, then the granules suddenly dissolve. And so I think this is an interesting hypothesis and one that we'll be working on in the future. But it really started to give us new insights into a very old problem and ones that we can now begin to understand. Are there dis genetic dis diseases associated with filaggrin mutations? There is, and in fact, this is another very common uh, skin disorder, inflammatory skin disorder known as atopic dermatitis. The patients with atopic dermatitis often lack epidermal granules and they retain their nuclei and they show skin barrier defects. So the mutations that exist in filaggrin that are responsible for this disorder turn out to be scattered throughout the filaggrin protein, causing truncated versions of the protein. And the protein itself is made up of repeat-like units. And these repeat-like units are the ones that can undergo temperature and pH sensitive and concentration sensitive changes in their conformation. And so, we then engineered these mutant uh, filaggrin proteins, and we demonstrated that, in fact, the patient mutations dramatically reduce the capacity of filaggrin to undergo these liquid phase dynamics. The outcome is nuclear retention and skin barrier defects. And so, again, uh, this new study is now shedding light on not only a very old problem for us, but also on a new human genetic disease. So in all of this, the epidermal stem cells are spared. Their pH is nicely 7.4. Instead, in producing the skin barrier, the stem cells are tucked nicely beneath the layers of enucleated dead cells that have to experience these extremes in temperature and pH and humidity. The stem cells produce a cytoskeleton that provides them with further protection, as I've described, and they also produce an underlying basement membrane that is rich in extracellular matrix and can also trap growth factors that control uh, the properties of the stem cells. The stem cells can also control the rate of synthesis of the basement membrane. And finally, in another piece of work that we just published a few months ago, actually a few weeks ago, we learned that the overlying epidermis and the underlying basement membrane are major sources of the natural mechanical forces that operate and control certain aspects of the properties of stem cells. And so overall, we've learned that essentially the epidermal stem cells are architects of their niche and their mechanical forces. So in wounds, then, when the cells experience uh, changes or reductions in their cell-cell interactions, 
and stimulate integrin mediated cell junctions that uh, they migrate and can produce increasing basement membrane in order to move in and repair at a wound bed. So when I moved to Rockefeller University, we began then to uh, address that last question of what are the other sources of stem cells that exist within the skin epithelium and we characterized the hair follicle stem cells, the sebaceous gland stem cells, the sweat gland stem cells, and also the committed progenitors, uh, particularly of the hair follicle, because those committed progenitors do proliferate for a while before they differentiate. And we're still uncovering new features of the stem cell niches, the interactions that stem cells undergo. So the stem cells reside at the interface between the epidermis and the dermis. They're defined, as we learned, both in their task and their gene expression by their local niches. And the niches then are different and they give different instructions to these stem cells that otherwise are quite similar to one another. The instructions for the epidermal stem cells make epidermis. For the sebaceous gland stem cells make sebaceous glands. And for the hair follicle, regrow the hair follicle and form hair. So one of the things that we've also learned is that in wounds, when stem cells have to exit their niche and move up and repair a wound, that they become plastic. They enter a state where they're able to multitask, where the hair follicle stem cells can repair, for instance, the epidermis. We characterized then and have really focused a lot of effort on the stem cells of the hair follicle. And the reason for that is that the stem cells, uh, these stem cells either spend a long period of time in quiescence or they are all actively synchronously uh, uh, regrowing the hair and producing hair. And so we characterize these stem cells we uh, put them into cell culture, much like Howard Green put epidermal stem cells into culture. And when we grafted these cells, we found that not only do they make hair follicles, but they also made epidermis and sebaceous glands. And again, this plastic behavior of stem cells when they're out of context, when they're outside of their niche, essentially uh, allows them this flexibility to uh, adopt the ability to make other tissues, in this case, other epithelial skin tissues. So the hair follicle really is this perfect system to determine how stem cells sit at rest and how they know when to make tissue. We learned from our studies at the molecular level that there are inhibitory signals that the quiescent stem cells experience to keep them in their quiescent state. We learned that there's a buildup during their quiescent state of activating cues that then send these stem cells on their way to produce short-lived progeny that then proliferate several times before they differentiate. And uh, in terms of making these decisions, the niche stem cell interactions decide. We also learned that the stem cells are synchronized because of their association with lymphatic vessels, which is something we just realized and just published within the last year. So we've also taken advantage of the high throughput technology that was coming onto the scene in our career, in my career, and we carried out genome-wide in vivo chromatin and transcriptome mapping in order to understand how these quiescent stem cells perceive and respond to changes in their microenvironment that promote tissue regeneration. I don't have time to tell you about those experiments, but let me tell you the lessons that we learned from studying hair regeneration. First, we learned that once sufficient activating cues accumulate, the stem cells divide asymmetrically to generate not only another stem cell, but also an early proliferative progeny. We then learned that these progeny at the early stages are still part of the stem cell niche, if you will, and they're able to send back stimulatory signals to the stem cells that fuel further tissue growth, that really grind up uh, the system and, and uh, produce tissue. At the end of hair growth, we learned that the differentiating cells now return back to the niche, and there they send out quiescent signals to raise the threshold for stem cells until a new tissue growth is necessary. 
So again, we're finding that stem cells are in large part in charge of their behavior. They're really architects of their niche and architects of their behavior. We've also done a lot of studies on chromatin dynamics and looking at the signaling uh, receiving changes that are occurring inside the nucleus. And it's really a switchboard of activity. We learned that stem cells receive hair regenerative cues to initiate hair growth. That's at the chromatin level. We learned that upon injury, they receive wound signals to initiate the repair process. That's at the chromatin level. And finally, most recently, we've learned that upon inflammation, the stem cells hyperproliferate, they change their chromatin, but then after the proliferation subsides, that they retain memories of their experiences packaged inside the chromatin, which really has tremendous implications for future understandings of uh, stem cells and their behavior. And then finally, we've been very interested in what happens when stem cells acquire mutations that ultimately will give rise to cancer. The cancer we're most interested in is squamous cell carcinoma. This is the second most common, sixth most deadly cancer worldwide. And I just point out the patients on immunosuppressive drugs for, for instance, organ transplants really have a very high increase risk of skin squamous cell carcinomas. So this is a very important cancer for one where therapeutics are really lacking or lagging. And indeed, most cancer therapeutics make people sick. They make them sick because the drugs typically target normal and tumorigenic cells, and in fact, often proliferative cells, which may not even necessarily be the stem cells. And our premise is that if we can understand enough about the differences between normal and tumorigenic stem cells, then we should be able to target tumor stem cells without harming their normal counterpart. That's our major goal for the future. And what we've learned so far is where the tumor initiating stem cells reside within these cancers. And we've also learned that microenvironment, again, plays an important role. And in fact, there's tumor heterogeneity in the microenvironment that's contributed to wherever blood vessels surround the tumor. Again, the tumor initiating stem cells, like the normal counterparts, are at the interface between the stroma and the tumor. But in this case, the stroma is very different than the normal dermis. And we've also shown that in fact, when there is a blood vessel nearby, that these tumor initiating cells receive another signal and that causes them to not only become invasive, but also become resistant to chemotherapy and to immunotherapy. Thus far, our studies have been in mice, but uh, the results have major implications for future with regards to cancer treatments. So uh, this just shows you in green, the tumor initiating cells that have received a, a blood vessel signal, and they're the ones that invade and the ones in yellow uh, proliferate very rapidly. They're still stem cells, but they grow smooth borders. And then finally, if we wash away chemotherapy or immunotherapy, these tumor initiating cells are also the cells responsible for tumor relapse. And so again, very important. So we've come a long way since I was a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Howard Green, showing that keratins are a super family of differentially expressed proteins in epithelial tissues. We've demonstrated uh, that we could clone and characterize stem cell proteins and their genes, and we could adapt that information to understand how skin stem cells survive at the body surface and the associated causes of genetic skin disorders when they don't. We then spent the next decade characterizing the various different stem cells of the skin epithelium. We uncovered the signals and transcription factors that instruct these stem cells when to be quiescent and when to make tissue, how stem cells self-renew and generate their committed progeny. And then finally, in the last decade, we focused on new genetic methods that we developed to do more rapid genetics in mice using to look at skin stem cells. And we've learned that stem cell plasticity occurs when stem cells are out of their niche and the importance of stem cell niches. We learned how the hair cycle works, how skin stem cells perceive and respond to signals, 
how skin stem cells cope with stresses, and ultimately how skin stem cells uh, ultimately can lead to cancer when they acquire mutations. What will happen in the future? We don't know, but I can say that often when you're not looking for something, that's when you really see something that's exciting. And so I cannot tell you what we'll be doing in the next decade, but I can tell you that I've got fantastic students, postdocs, and technical staff who are passionate about continuing the research that we've done. Thank you very much again to the Gardner Foundation and to my laboratory, past and present, uh, for their wonderful work over the years. Well, well, thank you, Elaine. Thank you all our speakers this morning for a very interesting uh, walk through the history of adhesion, uh, cell, uh, extracellular matrix, stem cells, and you can see, I'm sure, linkages between them all in that we're, they're all trying to understand how our genome gets translated into phenotypes from cells to skin to organs. So great talks. Thank you, Dr. Kemmler, Dr. Takeichi, Dr. Bissell, and Dr. Fuchs. They're going to be taking a break right now, but actually after that, then they are going to be meeting virtually with students in interactive sessions, something we all also like to do every year. Today's lectures have been recorded and they're going to be posted on our YouTube channel at Canada Gairdner Awards, so watch out for that. You can also check out our channel for recordings of our other events, including yesterday's Gairdner Global Perspectives panel, which featured the Drs. Abdul Karim, the Global Health Awardees this year, Dr. Tony Fauci, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, and many other global health experts discussing pandemic impact on global health and how to be prepared, as they said, not to build back better, but to build forward better. So join us tomorrow for day two of the Laureate Lectures, featuring Canada Gairdner Whiteman Award Laureate, Dr. Guy Rouleau, John Dirk's Canada Gairdner Global Health Award Laureates, Dr. Karisha and Salim Abdul Karim, and the fifth and final Canada Gardner International Award Laureate, Dr. Roel Nusser. Thank you and goodbye.